Hello, everybody. Welcome and thank you all for coming for a sixth lecture of a commemorative series of conference on the work of John Rawls. I'm Professor Daniel Simona Cimento, one of the organizers of the event and the host for this meeting. Our guest lecturer today is Professor Simone Chambers. Professor Chambers held professorships at the University of Colorado Boulder and the University of Toronto, where she was the director of the Center for Ethics, as well as fellowships at the Center of Human Values at Princeton University and the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Oslo. She's currently professor and chair of the Department of Political Science at the University of California, Irvine. To debate her lecture, we have Professor Ana Claudia Lopes from the University of Bahia. So let me briefly thank them for their presence here today. And without any more delay, welcome Professor Chambers to our event. Simone, the floor is yours. Welcome and thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Well, thank you very much for the invitation, and I apologize. The uh, I got the times wrong. I, I do a lot of Zooming, and um, the time differences always confuse me, so my apologies. Um, anyway, I am very happy to be here and to present some of my research. Just before I dive into the paper, I wanted to mention a little bit of background information. I am writing a book about contemporary democratic theory, and, um, and in the book, I talk about some of the main influences on democratic theory and two major influences are John Rawls and Jürgen Habermas. So for this paper, I extracted some of the passages and some of the arguments that I make in the book uh, regarding John Rawls's influence on democratic theory. So because it's been extracted from a larger manuscript, there are of course many missing parts. So of course, democratic theory is broader than um, what I just discussed in this paper. And John Rawls is, of course, broader than what I discuss in the paper. But I'm looking forward to your questions um, and also your comments as I try to perfect this argument. So I am going to read the paper. Um, and then afterwards, we can have um, question and answers. So this is, as I say, a paper about uh, Rawls and contemporary democratic theory. So John Rawls's relationship to democratic theory is not straightforward. On the one hand, democracy is palpably present in all his work, and that work has had enormous influence on the democratic thought. Uh, on democratic thought. On the other hand, Rawls does not say a great deal about democratic processes, procedures, or institutions. Either um, neither a, a theory of democracy, sorry, neither a theory of justice nor political liberalism is or contains a theory uh, in this sense. Sorry, I'm just going to fix my text here because it's great. Okay, so I can see. I just want to make sure I can see the chat in case somebody sends me a message. Um, yes. So a theory of justice, ne neither a theory of justice nor political liberalism it is or contains um, a theory of democracy in the usual sense. And there really is quite a consensus about this uh, when it comes to whether or not um, Rawls really contain has a democratic theory. In his later work, John Rawls explicitly identifies a well-ordered society as a deliberative democracy. But again, we never get much detail, certainly not much institutional detail about what that would look like. This is one reason why it is sometimes difficult to compare Rawls and Habermas. As Gordon Finlinson has so carefully laid out, Rawls was not very interested in the institutions and procedures of democratic governance and focused instead on an ethics of democratic citizenship. Whereas Habermas says little about such an ethic, talk about duty and citizenship for Habermas makes him a bit nervous, and focused instead on institutions and procedures. Like many others then, Finlinson agrees that, quote, Rawls does not have a theory of democracy, properly speaking, close quote, implying that a citizenship ethic is not a theory of democracy, prob properly speaking. A theory of democracy, properly speaking, for Finlinson and for many others, would have to contain some idea of how we govern ourselves democratically, not just what attitudes and practices we as individual citizens ought to adopt. So rather than trying to find or reconstruct a theory of democracy within John Rawls's work, I begin by looking at his influence on major trends and developments in contemporary democratic theory. So the claim here is that contemporary democratic theory has, for the most part, traded in disagreement about the best model of democracy for, on the one hand, debates about the value of democracy, and on the other, for a systemic or systematic approach to democracy that looks at the function of institutions, for example, the functions of direct democracy or representative or representative institutions, 
within a larger whole, rather than taking these institutions as offering a full model or blueprint of democracy. Rawls has contributed to both these moves. In the first move, the value of democracy debates um, breaks down into defenders of the intrinsic value of democracy versus those who defend the instrumental value of democracy. And this debate in turn has been shaped by the domination of questions of justice since the publication of a theory of justice. Regarding the second move, I look at the claim that a well-ordered society would be a deliberative democracy and argue that a deliberative democracy is not a model of democracy so much as a re-examination of the function of public justification within a democratic system. So I begin uh, with the relationship of democracy and justice. When a theory of justice first appeared, the focus of scholarly debate and interest was understandably on justice and especially on social equality. A theory of justice led to an exciting revival of egalitarianism in political philosophy that at the beginning was uninterested in democracy. But by, in a sense, reverse engineering contemporary debates in democratic theory, I want to suggest that the exclusive focus on social justice led to a new type of appreciation for democracy. Within contemporary democratic theory, questions about why we value democracy have begun to replace or displace questions about the best form of democracy. Of course, identifying the core appeal of democracy will have consequences for reform and questions about how we make democracy better. But for the most part, these are not articulated in terms of promoting one type of democracy over another. Tellingly, the contrast is often now about why we should value democracy over, for example, autocratic, technocratic, meritocratic, or epistocratic alternatives. This is tied to deep worries about the resilience of democracy in the 21st century. While it is rare to see philosophy, philosophers suggesting that democracy must go root and branch, it is not uncommon now to see arguments that less rather than more democracy would be a good thing, or to suggest that we lower our sights when it comes to what democracy can achieve. This context helps explain the shift to focus from competing models of democracy, you know, agonistic democracy, direct democracy, participatory democracy, deliberative democracy, representative democracy, and so on, but seeing these as competing models um, of democracy towards the idea of just the justification of democracy. But democracy in crisis cannot tell the whole story. Questions of justice launched by the publication of a theory of justice have also played a central role in this development. So what is so good about democracy? Why do we value it above other forms uh, of rule? The bait has evolved to produce two types of answers. One type of answer stresses that democracy's value is to be found in the procedures themselves more than the substantive outcomes that emerge from the procedures. Democracy might not always produce the best policy. Perhaps enlightened despots or benevolent technocrats might, might get it more, uh, right more often than the people. But democracy is the only, according to this argument, democracy is the only fair way to make decisions among people who see themselves as free and equal, and also among people who disagree. This type of theory is said to look at the intrinsic value of democracy and is described as procedural. The other set of arguments look at democratic procedures instrumentally or from the point of view of outcome. And th th these are actually not identical outcome and um, and instrumentality, and maybe we can talk about that uh, in the question and answer. I, I know that Danielle um, has a question about that. Um, here, democracy's value is that it produces better policy, law, and governance than other forms of decision making. Instrumental and outcome based views of democracy may also, of course, produce theory that is skeptical of overvaluing democracy. Perhaps democracy is not always the best way to take a decision. Perhaps democracy gets lots of things wrong and has bad outcomes. A strict instrumentalist will have to say that in these cases, we should rethink an unreserved enthusiasm for democracy. So in what follows in the paper, I, I concentrate on the intrinsic value of democracy. And one reason is because um, this is what this is influenced by Rawls. 
and Rawls has an argument for the intrinsic or procedural value of democracy and really has uh, almost no argument for the instrumental value of democracy in the sense of valuing it because it comes to, to um, correct outcomes. For example, Habermas does have an epistemic component of his um, democratic theory that if you have proper deliberation, the outcome should actually be rational or reasonable. Uh, but Rawls doesn't really contain, or, um, or according to my interpretation of Rawls, he doesn't have that epistemic component of democracy. So when we look at the intrinsic value um, of democracy, there are three aspects of Rawls's work that has had a lot of influence. The first is egalitarianism. The second is the idea of reasonable pluralism. And the third is the idea of public justification. So I begin with egalitarianism. The intrinsic versus instrumental value to democracy has been fueled in part by the question of the relationship between democracy and justice. This is most clearly seen in theories of democracy that argue that democratic procedures are to be valued because they instantiate equality. It is important to note, of course, that all theories of democracy, indeed all definitions of democracy, place political equality somewhere at the center. But not all theories of democracy rely on political equality to furnish the exclusive value of democracy. Political equality is the core principle of democracy and refers to the equality of persons qua citizens. Social equality, by contrast, um, uh, has traditionally referred to questions of the distribution of goods and opportunities or welfare within civil society broadly understood. This understanding of social equality dominated debates immediately following the public publication of a theory of justice. More recently, however, we see shifts from thinking about social equality in distributional terms to thinking about social equality in relational terms. And this is Elizabeth Anderson has really been quite essential in this move. Here, status and power become the central categories. Although many of the leading figures in egalitarian debates at the end of the 20th century or in the, you know, after the publication rather of a theory of justice, saw themselves as taking up questions centrally raised by Rawls in a theory of justice, Elizabeth Anderson suggests that much of the focus on the distribution of things within a context of undeserved differences seriously misread Rawls. One way to understand that misreading was that philosophical egalitarians forgot about democracy, people like G.A. Cohen, for example. For Anderson, this meant that egalitarians failed to think about what a democratic society, rather than a scheme of distribution, would or should look like. Egalitarians also failed to see the place and importance of political equality in the vision of a just society to emerge from a theory of justice. The shift to relational equality has brought democracy within the purview of egalitarian social justice theories. Relationally egalitarians make a strong claim for the intrinsic value of political equality. Social justice theory in the period immediately after the publication of the theory of justice tended to be abstract, ideal, and apolitical. Here's a helpful thought experiment to illustrate this problem. And this is a thought experiment that is used by Harry um, Brickhouse in his criticism of distributional or luck egalitarianism. What if you thought that egalitarian distribution of welfare, however you def that is defined, or the opportunities to achieve adequate levels um, of welfare was by far the most important task facing modern societies? In this situation, what would be wrong if a dictator or a benevolent technocrat brought that welfare about? Defenders of relational equality argue that a society that has a fair or egalitarian distribution of goods, but is not democratic is not just because it fails to address inequalities embedded in status and power, which is to say it fails to treat uh, each person with the appropriate type of equal respect. Levels and distribution of welfare are not irrelevant, of course, to status and power, but nor are they sufficient. Egalitarian social justice involves more than the distribution of things. It involves, and here's a quote from Sean Ingham, it involves, quote, a society whose members relate to each other as equals rather than as occupants of different ranks in a social hierarchy, close quote. Beginning in the late 1990s, one sees the growing insistence that democracy is a necessary condition of justice. 
for political equality is a necessary condition of social equality. Although the democratization of social justice theory developed as a criticism of the distributional questions that have dominated justice theory since the publication of the theory of justice, in another way, this strand of democratic theory is a continuation of the domination of questions of justice within political philosophy as democracy is now folded into justice. Democracy completes justice by first giving each citizen the equal opportunity to influence power, and second, giving each citizen the public recognition and affirmation of that equal status. And arguably, this was always present in a theory of justice, especially in sections 36 and 37, which dealt with um, political participation. Reading these sections in light of political, the later political liberalism gives them a new significance um, within a theory of justice. One person, one vote, the equal right to run for office and equal participation rights, such as freedom of speech and assembly are, to quote Griffin, a public affirmation of one's basic social status in the con context of jointly deciding the basic ground rules of common social life, close quote. This, as I say, this echoes the discussion of principles of equal participation in a theory of justice, as well as the discussion of status and the basis of self-respect at the end of a theory of justice. The role of public affirmation here is central. Equal voting rights give each citizen an equal say or equal influence, but the public affirmation involved in enshrining and protecting those rights embodies respect for persons in a special way. Flipping a coin, which is a very favorite example in people who look at um, trying to de de define what is a fair procedure. Flipping a coin might treat people fairly, impartially, or even equally in a decision procedure. But flipping a coin does not respect each person's judgment in the way that democratic procedures do. The intrinsic value here is not only in the equal distribution of power embodied in universal franchise, but in the value of the public recognition of equal respect for citizens as autonomous sources of value and judgment that equal voting rights articulates. So you, ha you have to have these constitutional public principles. Democracy then is said to have intrinsic value because this is quoting Harry Brickhouse again, value on the grounds that the implementation of democratic procedures is an indispensable means of demonstrating communal recognition. I think it's very important, the idea of demonstrating communal recognition of equal moral status of citizens, close quote. The inherent value of democracy then, democratic procedures then rests on these two elements, the equal opportunity to influence and the public affirmation of respect for the judgment of each citizen. And in the book, um, I defend really the public af affirmation as being more important in, in this definition than uh, the equality of influence. So that was one um, strand in contemporary democratic theory that is very much indebted to Rawls. And now I move to a second strand uh, of democratic theory that is also um, indebted to Rawls. So I want to briefly return to our social justice dictator, to our thought experiment, and to the question of what would be wrong about handing power to such an actor if one thought that justice and well-being were the most important ends that humans could or should pursue. One answer, the answer that we just canvassed in the preceding section, one answer is that such a system would neither treat citizens with equal respect nor publicly affirm that respect and so would not be just. Another and perhaps actually more common answer to the question is to, uh, to the, uh, sorry, common answer is to question the premise of the thought experiment. Is it really possible that any one actor could ever possess the truth about what social justice fully requires? Is there only one answer to what social justice requires? The problem here is that although we might all embrace the ideal of social justice, we disagree fundamentally about which social and economic arrangements might, that, um, might meet that standard of social justice. This is the problem of pluralism and disagreement, and it offers a second set of reasons for the inherent value of a procedure that treats people fairly and as equals. This view adds a second dimension to Rawlsian theory in the mix. In addition to understanding democracy and justice to be closely linked, 
Rawls' later arguments about reasonable pluralism complicate the question of when we can agree on justice, um, that when we can agree that justice has been done. The core of this argument goes something like this, and this is a quote from Laura Valentini. Democracy is what equal respect procedurally requires when the thick reasonable disagreement about what equal, equal respect Sorry, when there is a thick, reasonable disagreement about what equal res respect substantively requires. There are several ways that this core idea can be elaborated and defended. Here I look at two. I look at Thomas Cristiano's egalitarian view and then a mutual justification view that points to the special place of deliberation in democratic theory. Another view that I look at in the book is um, Jeremy Waldron's view, which is which is indebted to Rawls in the sense that all views that start with a premise of, of some form of disagreement are indebted um, to Rawls, but he is really not um, a Rawlsian in some in, in a pretty radical way because he, he rejects um, public reason. So we can also talk about that um, in the Q and A. Uh, so reasonable disagreement views understand the disagreement that poses a problem for which democracy is the solution not to be synonymous with any and all disagreement that we might meet in the empirical world. For example, every society has a certain number of mentally ill or just irrationally contrary people who will not agree to anything. We need to respect these people as persons, but to the extent that their disagreement is arbitrary, we need not accommodate that disagreement. Thus, the disagreement that matters is what is often called, as I've noted, reasonable disagreement. Reasonable disagreement has an epistemic and a normative meaning, and Rawls influenced both these meanings. Um, but his articulation, he, he has articulated one of the most influential epistemic meanings through the idea of burdens of judgment, which is, which is separate from the norm, because the normative idea is tied to public reason. And the burdens of judgment argument is just tied to uh, an epistemic claim about disagreement. So here, Rawls says that even if there was one right way to proceed or a correct answer, there are many hazards involved in the correct and conscientious exercise of our powers of reason and judgment in the ordinary course of political life. Questions about what we ought to do or how we should organize society are complex and many potential points of disagreement from, and we have many points of potential disagreement from the interpretation of evidence to different moral starting points. Absent coercion or domination, disagreement is inevitable and unavoidable. And this causes a challenge for collective action between individuals who consider themselves to be free and equal. Here the assumption is that a thoroughly reasonable and rational people of goodwill um, and committed to impartiality and judge in judgment, in other words, idealized reasoners will still disagree honestly about what questions um, are relevant in making decisions in complex societies. Uh, the second way reasonable is used introduces a normative or moral dimension. If we understand democracy as a decision procedure among equals to choose rules that will govern their collective life and honor and respect the equal status, then certain arguments or claims seem to be off the table right from the beginning. So for example, arguing that, and this is a quote from Joshua Cohen, arguing that, quote, some are worth less than others or that the interests of one group are to count for less than others, close quote. These types of arguments are, um, are out from the start. It would be unreasonable to expect that such arguments could be the basis of any fair system, just as it would be unreasonable to expect obviously false claims, such as the earth is flat, to be the basis of public policy. Or so the normative argument goes. Cristiano and also Jeremy Waldron and others um, uh, embrace some version of the epistemic argument, that is, we will always disagree on epistemic grounds um, about outcomes, but reject any strong version of the normative argument, that is, reasonable disagreement has to be understood within the bounds of some moral uh, limits, you usually understand in some, some form of public reason. Um, but mutual justification theories that I look at after Cristiano, uh, they embrace both the epistemic and the moral or normative meaning of uh, reasonable disagreement. 
So let me first look at Cristiano and then we'll go to mutual justification. Thomas Cristiano defends the value of democracy as part of a larger egalitarian view of justice. And to this extent, he is part of a large section of contemporary democratic theory that um, is indirectly indebted to a theory of justice for its fundamental reshaping of political philosophy in the second half of the 20th century. Thus, his theory exhibits similarities with the egalitarian views um, I discussed in the preceding section. But he adds disagreement as a central feature to his argument, something that relational egalitarians usually do not do. Relational egalitarians argue that democracy understood as the instantiation and public affirmation of equal power and status of every citizen is a necessary condition of a just social order. Hierarchy is the enemy of justice here. Cristiano begins his defense of democracy not with a relational view of equality, but with the claim that justice requires the public realization of the equal advancement of interest. Unequal advancement of interests is the enemy of justice for Cristiano. This principle yields the intuition that laws and policies ought to advance the interests of each member of society equally and further that it must be publicly known or acknowledged that laws and policies advance the equal interest of all. It is not simply that justice should be done. Justice should be shown to be done to fulfill the principle that each person is treated equally and sees and recognizes that she is treated equally. Cristiano concedes that widespread and ubiquitous disagreement poses a challenge for this standard of justice. We are fallible in our judgments. We are subject to biases in our thinking. We often fail to be impartial in weighing our interests against each other. Uh, it's interesting to note that Rawls's burdens of judgment um, argument says that we're going to disagree even if we were perfect reasoners and Cristiano's, um, it is still a burdens of judgment argument, but he adds a lot of social psychology and political psychology and our biases, which Rawls doesn't, uh, as a background condition of inevitable, inevitable disagreement. So, um, so we have these biases in our judgment and to complicate the picture of judgment, we know these things about ourselves and others so that we are unlikely to agree that the outcome of our collective decision procedures do in fact treat everyone's interests equally. The problem then is not simply that we may and most certainly will disagree about say which tax system is the most just. That disagreement makes it impossible for democratically chosen tax systems, even if it was the most just in some independent standard, to stand as a public affirmation of the principle of equal advancement of everyone's interest. The procedural equality of democratic decision making, as well as the public recognition of certain basic liberty, uh, liber liberal rights, are, according to Cristiano, uniquely suited to satisfy this interest. So the outcomes of democratic procedures cannot satisfy the, um, the interest in equality, but the formal procedures of democratic participation or political participation can. Unlike substantive policies and laws, the formal recognition of procedural equality, equal voting rights, etc., cetera, can, can be a point of collective recogni recognition of equal treatment. Disagreement means that outcomes of democratic procedures can never achieve such publicity. It is important to note that disagreement is primarily focused on whether the outcomes of democratic procedures, that is laws and policies, treat people as equals or establish justice. Cristiano appears to be confident that we can agree that the procedures of democracy, as well as basic liberal rights, treat us as equals. So there is, of course, some level of agreement um, involved here. In other words, while we cannot agree when or how justice is established, we can and do agree on a conception of justice as equal treatment of interest and then embodied in um, formal procedures. So this is also challenged by somebody like um, uh, Jeremy Waldron, who has who thinks that disagreement, in a sense, goes all the way down. 
So now I turn to the third view of equality that comes out of Rawls, um, and this is the idea. So the first is just egalitarianism, that is social, social equality. The second is um, dis equality and disagreement. And this third one now is an idea of justification among equals. I turn now to the third equality-centered way to view the intrinsic value of democratic procedures or the inherent value of democratic procedures. In this view, disagreement points to a special role of democratic deliberation and mutual justification as, a, as instantiations of equal respect. Egalitarians, we saw in the first section, identify the inherent value of democracy in the way that constitutionally protected rights of equal political participation publicly affirm the moral status of citizens. Mutual justification Democrats identify the inherent value of democracy in the way, and this is a quote again from Laura Valentini, the way deliberating and listening to one another's reasons expresses respect for each other as rational persons, close quote. The idea of mutual justification introduces several new ideas to our discussion of democracy. The first is that the procedures thought to instantiate equality and give value to democracy expand beyond voting rights. Suppose we are 20 people shipwrecked on a deserted island. We need to make some decisions and take some collective action. Why should we choose democracy as a way to do this? Um, up until now, we have understood de democracy in ge generic and institutionally underspecified terms as one person, one vote, equal right to run for office, equal participation rights, a, fr a freedom of speech um, and assembly. Um, so far, the argument has been that if we are the sort of people who think of ourselves as equal, and modern citizens generally are those sorts of people, we will choose democracy because it is fair, not because it necessarily comes to the best solution every time. That's, that's according to the arguments I have so far uh, looked at. The fairness among equals or the fairness among equals who disagree has its focal point in the constitutionally guarantee of free and fair elections. Mutual justification theories expand democratic procedures to include processes of deliberation and public discourse. They shift the locus of value to deliberation and make voting instrumental to the value of mutual justification. Here, our shipwrecked proto-citizens treat each other with respect and as equal citizens when they exchange reasons of a certain kind and offer justifications of a certain kind for the proposals they make for organizing their collective life. Votes are eventually taken, as unanimity is difficult to achieve, even among 20 people, but the democratic moment inheres in a type of mutual problem solving in which each member treats fellow members as equal partners in the process. Our thought experiment of the 20 shipwrecked founders illustrates that we could imagine, although even that is unlikely, but we could imagine them coming to an essentially democratic decision in the sense of equal influence, participation, and cooperation in which no votes are taken at all, or in which there's a series of straw votes taken or hands go up over the course, um, but there's no one um, necessarily final vote. Here, we would imagine that each person's proposals, suggestions, and arguments would get an equal airing and consideration, the conversation would, and the conversation would res, um, proceed uh, respectfully. At the end of the day, the group would come to a consensus, which is not the same thing as unanimity. This is a question that Daniel posed to me, so we can discuss it maybe in Q&A. Would come to a consensus about the best course of action. This is an idealized thought experiment, even for 20 people. And once the numbers are scaled up and one introduces complexity, then voting becomes a necessary mechanism uh, of closure. But different, but, but different, you can have majority voting, you can have uh, supermajority voting, you can have all sorts of different kinds of, um, of voting. So voting is introduced as a decision or closure procedure, and it is not really the center of what, um, of the exercise and articulation of equality. So what is important here is that cooperative and discursive collective action, collective action problem solving among equals is the core of the democratic ideal and voting is only one institutional mechanism to operationalize that. 
Does this mean that mutual justification theorists see voting rights as simply instrumentally necessary when we scale up, that we could imagine some democracy without any voting rights? No. So I make a distinction between voting rights or, or more strictly um, citizenship rights uh, and actual elections or actual exercise um, of votes, referendums, um, so on and so forth. The public recognition of political equality enshrined in voting rights or in the protection of um, individual citizen rights is essential as the foundation and prerequisite for the more robust view of full political equality embodied in mutual justification. There can be no mutual justification without the recognition of equal status, and that recognition needs to be articulated and protected in constitutions. It is not voting rights that are instrumentalized. It is elections and vote processes that punctuate the ongoing process of mutual justification that lose their central role. Mutual justification view then is not an alternative to the equal status view. It builds and extends that view. Mutual justification theories rarely defend democracy on the exclusive grounds that equality is instantiated in the procedures of well-ordered um, deliberation. In addition, some theories also introduces, introduce ideas of freedom and autonomy. Habermas also actually Rawls. I think both Rawls and Habermas have a um, co-originality between um, freedom and equality, as well as epistemic arguments regarding good outcomes. So here Habermas also would be included, but also somebody like Fa Fabian Peter. But here I isolate the part of the argument that focuses on the challenge posed by disagreement among equals and the way mutual justification proposes to solve that problem. Earlier, I noted that citizens treat in this view, that citizens treat each other with respect and as equal citizens when they exchange reasons of a certain kind and offer justifications of a certain kind for proposals they make for organizing their collective life. Now we need to ask what kind of reasons? Rawls offers a very powerful illustration of why simply requiring each participant to explain and justify their preferred course of action, while it might show a minimal level of respect, is not enough. Calvin, it is reported, had a conversation with Michael Servetus a week before he was to be burned at the stake for heresy, in which he laid out the reasons and justifications for the sentence. Servetus no doubt, no doubt understood very well why Calvin wanted to burn him at the stake, and Calvin's visit might even be seen as a sign of a sort of perhaps grudging respect. But offering reasons for religious persecution of one group of citizens is not a reasonable proposal to make in a process of mutual justification among equals. This introduces the normative idea of reasonable that I mentioned briefly above. It would be unreasonable for a minority of our desert, uh, deserted islanders to propose that the majority become their slaves, even if they offered detailed justifications for such a proposal. Given that they had decided to solve their problems democratically, or, which comes to the same thing, that they began from the premise that they were each free and equal as everyone else. Thus, the ideal of mutual justification suggests democratic problem solving under modern conditions of disagreement and pluralism involves a special sort of conversation. In this conversation, and now I'm quoting Joshua Cohen, quote, participants regard one another as equals. They aim to defend and criticize institutions and programs in terms and considerations that others have reason to accept given the fact of reasonable pluralism, close quote. Cristiano thinks that we can agree that the formal political equality, that formal political equality of voting rights, et cetera, treats each of us as equals. Joshua Cohen, in this quote I just uh, read, introduces a more demanding idea that we might be able to come to agreement about substantive matters if we structured the deliberation in a special way. All three views that all three views offered that I've looked at, the egalitarian view, the disagreement view, or the um, disagreement and equality view, and the mutual justification view, all three views then offer arguments for why we should value procedures of democracy independent of the outcomes. All three can be seen as part of a new chapter in democratic theory that challenges 
any stark divide or tension between liberalism and democracy. Thus, the various ways, thus in various ways, they all embrace the idea of co-originality, one, one that can be seen in Rawls's work as far back as a theory of justice. But value of democracy arguments are yet, sorry, the value of document, democracy arguments are not yet full theories of democracy, if we understand that to mean some story about how we actually govern ourselves, nor do they contain or even point to a model of democracy. I turn now to the claim that the models, the claim that models of democracy are less useful than they once were, and to, and to use uh, deliberative democracy as an example to make this point. So now I, um, I move to my last section. What is a deliberative democracy? Rawls famously says that he is concerned with a well-ordered, um, this is in um, um, Public Reason Revisited. Rawls famously says that he is concerned with a well-ordered constitutional democracy understood as a deliberative democracy. And he seems to use the term within the tradition of democratic theory that proceeds by comparing and contrasting models of democracy. And at this point, he, he cites David Held, who has a very famous book called The Models of Democracy. So this conjures up the picture that we need to bring about deliberative democracy or swap out some institutions for others. It leads to questions like, what would a deliberative democracy look like, say, as opposed to a representative democracy? And as somebody who works in deliberative democracy, I get asked that question all the time. But the question really should be, what would a well-ordered democracy uh, look like? So I want, I want to explain this, that distinction. Deliberative democracy designates a large research agenda within which there is a great deal of disagreement and variation. Something like Rawls's idea of public justification or mutual justification is, um, as I have sketched it above, stands at the center. But the concept of mutual justification, as I've also noted, is not a democratic theory. And from that starting point, theories go in some very different directions. One big dividing line, for example, is the centrality of public reason to one's view of deliberative democracy. This breaks down into two questions. The first is whether one looks at democracy primarily from the point of view of, citizen, of a citizen's ethic, that is what kind of arguments and you know, the, the idea of a duty of civility from Rawls, um, or a, a, a citizen ethic and a set of attitudes, or whether one looks at mutual justification from the point of view of the procedural and institutional structures of decision-making that can facilitate or contain mutual justification. This very roughly divides Rawlsians from Habermasians. The second divide is the content of public reason, especially how much sharedness or agreement uh, or consensus or, or restraint is envisioned. In some sense, all deliberative democracy theories endorse a generic idea of public reason. No one would think that Calvin's arguments addressed to servitus or defenses of slavery could be part of a democratic debate among equals. But there is a very large difference in how much restraint uh, is envisioned as needed to operationalize mutual justification or the level, <coughs> or the level, me, level of consensus thought reachable in modern systems. So I would put, for example, Joshua Cohen at one end, who thinks that there is quite a lot of um, and, and people like Amy Gutman at one end thinks that we do need um, a lot of agreement and maybe me at the other end thinks it's only really minimal agreement. These two axes of disagreement within the Rawlsian influence of deliberative democracy are only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to differences and variations within the full deliberative democracy paradigm. I want to suggest that deliberative democracy is not a model of democracy. And further, that thinking about democratic theory as being packaged in models is no longer helpful. The first problem with the model approach is that it suggests that if we want to talk about deliberative democracy, we need to begin with a comprehensive definition of what it is. That is, what, what it is, what, what is a deliberative democracy understood as a noun. But most definitions will fail to come close to encompassing what is now included in this research paradigm. A useful comparison might be how we look at the term representative democracy and deliberative democracy. Representative democracy usually does not designate an approach or a theory. It more often is used to loosely identify the institutional development of constitutional democracy since the end of the 18th century. 
Deliberative democracy does not offer an alternative to this institutional legacy, but rather a refocusing on different elements within that system. Habermas offers a very clear example of this, but this is an apt way to con conceptualize all deliberative democracy theory. Haber not, not the substantive content, rather, but the methodological approach. Habermas's reconstruction of, the, of constitutional democracy in discursive terms suggests that all liberal democracies can be evaluated and understood through deliberative categories, including ones that are like, you know, very poorly deliberative. All constitutional democracies are more or less deliberative democracies in this sense. And one job of the critical theorist is to evaluate the dimensions of more or less. And these days it's usually less. Um, thus the question is not, what would a deliberative democracy look like and how would it be different from say a representative democracy? It is to shift the emphasis on what is important to look at, study and worry about in any democratic system. Now, one might want to say that this also can be understood as a model. I have used terms like paradigm and framework, but how is this different from model? What is really at stake in the question that, um, at stake in questioning the model's framework for democratic theory? A model of democracy framework tends to think about models as if they were ideologies in competition. This perspective stands behind the questions like, how would a deliberative democracy be different from a representative democracy? Contemporary democratic theory is full of disagreement and criticism. As is natural within such intellectual debates, people stake out positions by way of contrast and criticism. And we give names to those positions by invoking adjectives to qualify, the, uh, qualify democracy, open democracy, agonistic democracy, militant democracy, and so on. But thinking about these disagreements and criticisms in terms of competing models of democracy does a disservice to the complexity of these disputes. Philosophers who identify as agonistic Democrats, for example, have significant and important disagreements with many of the premises of deliberative democracy, as well as the political stat strategies one might adopt to improve democracy. But these differences do not come with competing blueprints about how we should organize the institutions of democracy. Democracy is a complex system with agonistic elements alongside deliberative elements. Imagining that agonism and deliberation offer two different or competing types of democracy obscures the real difference and sends people searching for defining characteristics. Models of democracy as an organizing structure to discuss contemporary democratic theory fails to consider the varieties of disagreement within traditions. Republicanism, for example, um, cannot really be thought as, as offering a model of democracy in any strong sense. One of the more interesting aspects of republicanism today is how its core concept of non-domination can inspire the liberal views of Philip Pettit at the same time as the radical plebeian views of John McCormick. The variation within deliberative democracy is, if anything, broader than within republican theory. Helen Londemore, for example, identifies as a deliberative Democrat um, with a democratic theory suggesting that we could do away with all elections. This is hard to square with Rawls's idea of a deliberative democracy, and yet they do actually share the idea of mutual justification. Finally, the era of models of democracy was tied to an era of ideological optimism. It was tied to an era where the question was essentially, what is the best form of democracy? And it was not insane to suggest that we were approaching some version of the end of history. Today, how can we save democracy is increasingly the default question we face. Deliberative democracy, whether it be a Rawlsian concern with public reason, a Habermasian concern with the public sphere, uh, Jane Mansbridge concern for the linkages between different sites of deliberation in the system, or John Dreisek's concern for the discourse on climate and migration. All of these are about grasping the role and function of mutual justification within dif a differentiated system. Sometimes it will lead to radical conclusions that question electoral institutions. Sometimes it will lead to endorsing contestatory politics as the only politics that can kickstart a moribund or corrupt culture of public conversation. Or it might focus on the constitution and battles over fundamental principles as the site of mutual justification. Trying to capture the true model of deliberative democracy and compare and contrast it to some other model, say aggregative or minimalist, will inevitably lead to a reductionist approach.
So my conclusion, well, it's very short. Um, Rawls has said not to have a theory of democracy, but he clearly tells us why we should value democracy and he asks us to refocus on the way the basic structure and constitutional essentials structure a type of public conversation in which we present and justify solutions to political problems and disagreements in such a way that acknowledges and respects our equal status in the process. These two components are the core features of contemporary debates about democratic theory. What is so good about democracy and what part of the system contains the value? Um, so not only does he not have a theory of democracy, but uh, nor does he have, uh, or nor does his theory contain, or nor does his theory of justice contain a model of democracy. So the end. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to close this up. Thank you ah, very much. For a, back. Yeah, for a very clear presentation. Uh, we'll have the question now by Anna Claudia. Anna, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Actually, thank you, Bruno Carriello and Ulysses Ferraz and Daniel for inviting me to join the series of conferences to celebrate Rawls theory of justice. Some of you know I'm not a Rawlsian scholar. This is important to state from the beginning. Uh, and actually, far from that, uh, I, I've been learning a lot uh, with this series. And I also thank uh, you uh, for inviting me to join particularly this conversation with Simone Chambers, to whom I thank not only for this paper and this presentation, uh, but, but also uh, for her, her work in general. Uh, concerning this very specific paper, I will put my, my time here, otherwise I will speak in a lot, I'm sorry. Um, concerning this, this very specific paper uh, Simone just presented us, uh, I, I think it's important to highlight that once again, she helps us to navigate, she helps us in, in navigating the waters of contemporary democratic theory by offering a comprehensive and accurate view of what was and is going on since Rawls' revolution uh, in, with his theory of justice. I have sketched two or three issues to bring to our discussion, uh, but first I'd like to highlight uh, some points. Uh, first is that Simone's attempt is to show how a theory of justice and Rawls work in general, in spite of not offering a theory of democracy, as she just said, it changed the conversation in political philosophy, and that, in turn, has had an, an important impact on democratic theory. She just said that. And I'm in agreement in, in many senses with this. And she also traces a, such a change and its impact, referring to two main shifts on the contemporary debate, which she just brought uh, to us. And I, I, I want to highlight two, 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 th these two shifts to, to, to put my questions. So the first is a shift from a discussion on the best model of democracy to a debate about the value of democracy that was, after Rawls, shaped by the prevalence of questions of justice, not only social, but also political. Indeed, uh, Simone's point is that in Rawls' work, I quote uh, from page eight of the paper, democracy is folded into justice. And it is on the basis of this shift, I mean, the prevalence of questions about why we value democracy, that she traces the tracks of arguments defending the intrinsic value for democracy, which are indebted to, to roles, egalitarianism, reasonable pluralism, and public, public justification. If I understood, these tracks are not competing, and this is important to, 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 to state. I think it is important to state. Uh, the second, uh, and I, actually I apologize because I'm, I'm a bit too nervous uh, in being speaking uh, uh, in YouTube in, in English, so I do apologize for, for my nervousism. Please uh, pardon me. I beg your pardon. But uh, the second is a shift from the discussion of the best model of democracy, meaning a full model of democracy, uh, to a sort of a systemic approach that looks at the function of institutions, if I understood you properly, Simone, uh, 
It is on the basis of the second shift, if I understood correctly, that you advance the claim that deliberative democracy is not a model, which is a central claim of the paper. And there is also a, a third point I want to, 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 to highlight, uh, is the one that relates to a contrast between Rawls and Habermas in what relates uh, uh, to what I, I would call a virtue ax, ax. I will come back to, to this in a minute. So uh, I will come back to this in a minute because I wanna call attention to two or three more general, perhaps trivial issues I want to, to bring to, to our conversation. The first concerns precisely the way you frame the contrast between Habermas and Rawls on the paper. The second relates to your claim that deliberative democracy is not a model of democracy. And the third relates to a claim you advanced about arguments which are off the table from the perspective of mutual justification, of the mutual justification track. So first on virtues and family quarrels. Um, as you just pointed, Rawls would not have a theory of democracy, properly speaking. A point you also made in, in, in your paper of 2003 on deliberative democracy. His work, as you, as, you, as you argue, would be less concerned with the institutional setting, perhaps because he takes it for granted, and focused instead on what you call here in this paper an ethics of democratic citizenship. It is thus concerned in a sense more with attitudes and practices or to borrow James Gordon Fulaison's words in his 2019 book to the obligations uh, of, individual, of individual citizens to one another. Habermas, as you point, would be averse to such a talk about virtues. But I'm not sure uh, about this divide, about this contrast between them. Because actually, I'm not sure Habermas deliberative democracy can stand without something others, but not him, would call virtues. I mean, is it really the case that the discursive process Habermas refers with the principle of discourse and I'm not uh, thinking here uh, on moral consciousness and communicative action, but rather in between facts and norms. Anyway, is it the case that the discursive process does not rely on some minimal ethos, some sort of virtues of conversation, if we can phrase this way, some minimal, at least epistemic virtues? This is my, my first question. The second one is on models, because I'm... I'm I'm not sure I, I understand uh, the point uh, on, on your challenge of the understanding of the deliberative democracy as a model, because you, you claim that, that to think about democratic theory in terms of models is no longer helpful. And you just said that one could understand as a model, but you, you still maintain that you reject the, this idea of, of, of thinking about uh, deliberative democracy as a model. I mean, we have two steps. You point something that appeared in your previous work, constitutional democracies. You just finished your 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 presentation with this with this phrase, and it's also on the paper. Constitutional democracies are all more or less deliberative, right? And you offer a strict understanding of models when you claim that the thinking about models. As I, I, when you claim that models are thought as ideologies in competition. Thus, one cannot talk of models properly speaking when it comes to deliberative democracy because we talk about the shift of emphasis. And again, all constitutional democracy, our constitutional democracies are more or less deliberative. And also underscores, I think uh, you have in mind the critical edge of indifferent proposals of deliberative democracy. So we have the critical edge in the Rousian type, uh, concerned with public reason, Habermas concerned with the public sphere, sphere, Mansbridge, Drizek, and so on. But 
my my question is whether you could elaborate elaborate a little more on, on what you understand by model what are we talking about when we we are talking about models because one can understand models the, the way you describe so so models as ideologies in competition I would also ask uh, uh, you to, to develop a bit on the definition of ideology at work here. But one can also understand in the hard science way of understanding models. So in, in which we have models as simplified representations that enable uh, provisions that enable um, to, to, to foresee uh, or and, and actually to, to experience and test some mm -hmm some 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 um, some premises and some some what was represented and the third a third way to understand a model and I, I suspect this is the way he held this in his book but you please correct me if I'm wrong is a much more losing understanding of a model of models can be understood as grasping grasping general features used for more or less classificatory purposes, more or less as types, if you like, not pure types, but more or less in a losing uh, way. So in a sense, this is more of a clarification question. I wanted you to expand a bit further your view on models and why it, it is not the case that uh, we can expand our understanding of the mo of a model of deliberative democracy to encompass what is included in deliberative democracy as a research paradigm, as you prefer, uh, both on empirical and on normative levels. So we can still talk about models. That's, that, that would be my point. We can still talk about models if we do expand it, but of course in a non-reductionist way, non-reductionist way, of course not in a competitive way, and of course, not thinking that models do offer precise, accurate designs, nor blueprints. So if you could expand a bit further, there's the, your view on models. And my last point, and I, I, I would think it would be, I, I don't know I, if I could give it a name, it would be perhaps on timbers against timbers. Uh, it relates to a claim you just advanced about certain arguments or claims which are off the table. This is particularly discussed when you turn to reasonable pluralism and contrast the Thomas Christiano position with the, the one of the mutual justification theorists, right? Christiano would accept the epistemic meaning of reasonable disagreement, as you as you claim in your paper, uh, developed uh, the, this epistemic meaning developed through the idea of the burdens of judgment, right? But he would not accept what you call uh, what we can call you call and we can call the normative or moral dimension, uh, in which in this dimension uh, you place this call of the table argument. On the other hand, mutual justification theorists would require both the epistemic and the normative meanings, right? On this point, I have two questions. One from the non rawlsian pers scholar perspective I have, and the question is, is this off the table argument really part of Rawls' views on public reason? I mean, the requirement, the requirement to provide mutually acceptable justification mm -hmm. when reasoning together to decide on constitutional essentials, essentials and questions of basic justice. This, requir this re requirement does provide in advance a sort of a gag rule on what can be or not introduced in the debate. Of course, we have a moral duty of civility. All of us as citizens are subject to this non-enforceable duty, since it's a, it's a moral duty, it's not enforceable. 
But this that is, would be particularly required, according to Rawls, to public officials, right? In any case, I'd rather thought, I mean, I always thought that the criterion of reciprocity sets a threshold, but not in advance. I mean, that only after something is said, we do know if it complies or not with the non-enforceable duty of civility. My point is that I always thought that people should first speak up, so to speak. And this comes to my second uh, question uh, on this on this point and the last one. Um, I think this would be particularly important uh, when we think of deliberative democracy, not restricted to the state and its agencies, right? What I think is also, and this I think is also, is a concern, if not the main concern, of the mutual justification track you, you, you describe. Since this mutual justification track, I, I would think it is concerned with process of deliberation and public discourse. And precisely at this level, my question is, should we really say that some claims are in advance off the table. I do find some difficult in, in seeing this off the table in advance, um, both from a Rawlsian perspective and from a more expanded view on the public sphere, such as we find not only in Habermas work, but in your own work as well. So I have some 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 points here, but I will skip to, 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 to the end. Uh, because my point is that I'm afraid this sort of off the table argument tend to repress in advance some problematic and we could even say wrong or false beliefs. Beliefs that should be challenged in public in a, in a large sense. And I'm, I'm not sure you, 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 you disagree with this. So what I mean is that um, are not the unreasonable views, the unreasonable beliefs, the unreasonable attitudes, and not only from the right, uh, what we should bring to the table. Because besides of understanding how this position came about and what ideologies are at work here as citizens that, that we are, we have to challenge these views, if not to change minds through debate, at least to show their incorrectness, their falsehood. But in order to do so, we do need people to speak up. We need to know what are those problematic, false or wrong claims which are circulating. Of course, I do not mean a magic wand nor a Pollyanna call that by talking, we understand each other, that by talking, we necessarily always enhance our knowledge and so on. A conversation can turn it into many things, even into a fight. And people do stick with nonsense everywhere. And I'm, I, I, it's important to say that I'm not, I'm not talking about media conglomerates who profit from misinformation while committing also some possible criminal violations and so on. But to make my point clear, I had the impression that this off-the-table argument does not fit uh, with Rawls' views on public reason, and I'm almost sure it does not fit a more expanded, less institution institutional setting for deliberative democracy. So to sum up, I have uh, three questions, three general questions, and actually, to ask you if you could expand a bit further on this virtue axis dividing Habermas and Rawls, on what is the point of rejecting that deliberative democracy is a model of democracy, what is precisely the point, what are you understanding precisely by model, and if you could elaborate a bit further on this off-the-table argument in contrast to the people, I mean, persons in the plural, people should first speak up, I brought.
I thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to join this conversation. And I also thanks to everyone and especially to Simone uh, for, the patience, for the patience. Thank you. Okay, that, that was great. So should, should I, I go ahead and, and, and respond? Okay. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, wonderful questions, hard questions. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, okay, so let's just dive in. So the virtues, yeah. So, so you're right. I mean, but Rawls talks in terms of a duty of civility, and um, and Rawls does talk in terms of individual um, kind of private ethical views. Habermas doesn't talk in that idiom, but what he does talk about is in the terms of sociology. He says things like the life world has to meet you know, the institutions halfway. So you can't just bring democracy to a place where nobody is a Democrat. So there has to be an ethos. It's very true for Habermas. Um, but he thinks of that ethos um, not as a requirement that I, as a political philosopher, look out in the world and say, you must have these virtues, these moral virtues, uh, and we must try to instill these moral virtues. Instead, he looks at it more sociologically that is only when a society has sort of inculcated or, or sort of internalized certain levels of basic um, principles of democracy that doesn't necessarily make them good people, right? But what it does is it makes them, they think of themselves as free and equal and they understand that be, thinking of yourself as free and equal or living in a democratic constitutional state um, requires certain types of um, of behavior and certain types of uh, acceptance of some principles. Now, some people say this is a this is a bit of a cop out because it really is a virtue theory. But Habermas really doesn't want to say it's a virtue theory um, because the virtue. First of all, he doesn't want to have a very high bar for citizenship, right? So it does appear for Rawls, depending on your interpretation of a duty of civility, that it's a pretty high citizenship bar that we need to be willing, especially, and this, this is going to come to your um, third question, especially if a duty of civility requires that we suppress our comprehensive views, right? That we suppress our strongest views about religion and about those kinds of things, um, and that we only use um, arguments that are within political liberalism. So this appears to require all of us to live up to, at an individual level, a, a moral standard of liberal citizenship, which if you look at the world around us, um, it seems pretty impossible to imagine that kind of moral transformation of citizens in general. Habermas, so he doesn't want to, to have that kind of high um, virtue bar that's necessary for a you know, minimally well-working liberal democracy. So instead, he wants to have something like constitutional patriotism or some kind of minimally internalized acceptance of the basic um, ideas of, of, of rights, right? And he doesn't talk about them in terms of virtue. It, it is similar. I think in the end, it is a lower bar. And, and the, the lower bar comes exactly to your third question um, about the difference um, about what's on and off the table. Uh, but it is actually a lower bar for Habermas, and it's not, um, it's not, it's really not about individual atti moral attitudes. It's, it's more about background assumptions of living in modern democratic states, I guess. Yeah, the question of models. So, um, okay, so I don't have a definition of models, and one of the reasons why I don't have a definition of models is... So I had this intuition, right, that um, all this stuff about, you know, what is the difference? Because I get asked all the time, what is the difference between deliberative democracy and representative democracy? What is the difference between deliberative democracy and agonistic democracy? What is the difference between aggregative democracy and deliberative democracy? I review journal articles all the time that say, okay, this is what deliberative democracy is as a model. And, and they always, it, it never actually encompasses what deliberative democracy is. Um, and people use the term model, and my complaint actually about that is your complaint about me. So my complaint is that people use the word model, they don't know what they're using. They're, they're, not, they're just using it kind of 
in, in, in no, and even David Hell, I've gone over and over that text many times, and you can't really find a proper definition as you implied, right? It's just a kind of, um, but there is this more, I guess, perhaps even rhetorical level that when you think about models, then you think of them in competition with each other. So, and, um, and I find this particularly problematic. So take something like aggregate democracy, right? So I, you know, I've read paper, and maybe, maybe you just say these are just not good papers, but people say, yeah, well, if you're a deliberate de Democrat, you're against elections. You don't like voting, right? But it's not that you're against elections or, or counting votes, right? It's that the idea of just voting without talking first is just not, so you kind of, you're, you're refocusing um, and, and thinking about aggregative democracy as somehow in competition with deliberative democracy um, is just, it, it's, and, and thinking about that is ac actually, um, I think the result of the rhetoric of models, if you will, as opposed to, um, as opposed to actually people using the term model in any kind of a strict um, sense. You also see this, for example, in direct democracy. So it used to be that um, people thought about referendums and initiatives and plebiscites. So that's direct democracy. And that is in tension with, or always in opposition to electoral or, um, excuse me, representative democracy. But if you look at the democratic system as a complex system, you see that most, first of all, there are, are, are hundreds, perhaps thousands of different ways to institutionally integrate initiatives, referendums, and plebiscites within a democratic system. Most of them actually work with um, representative, representative systems, not against representative systems. Few of them can actually be described as strictly uh, direct, depending on you know what what you mean by direct. And the rhetoric of these these two models has really just um, been been very unhelpful in understanding how these institutions, uh, say we we'll call them popular voting institutions of popular voting versus. Um, of uh, uh, voting, uh, sorry, uh, electing representatives, how they integrate with each other. So, um, but you do point out something that I haven't really worked out what I um, yet perfectly, um, how I want to articulate the problems of models. Um, and, and one of the things, is I, as I said, I, like you said, I don't have a definition of models, and it's primarily because all the people who use the term model don't have a definition of model. And I think it's really particularly unhelpful for deliberative democracy because there's so much variation within that tradition that um, the idea that you could say, well, this is what, you know, the deliberative democracy model is in any, um, it is it's just it's never it's always going to be wrong i think so um yeah so it's so it's not a hard theoretical or philosophical point i'm making about models it's really more um about a kind of the, the rhetoric of models um being unhelpful in really understanding um, the, the arguments and controversies and issues that are being raised in contemporary democratic theory right now. Um, and I think, you know, Rawls saying something like constitutional, constitutional liberalism as a deliberative democracy. Um, I mean, maybe he meant it in the, in the sense that Habermas says, it just means that I'm looking at it that way. So, you know, you can go to look at, I don't know, I've been writing about Hungary, right? So Hungary is a big mess. Actually, the United States is a big mess right now. So I have my deliberative democracy lens and I say, okay, well, here's the problem. If I had a behavioral aggregate of democracy lens, I'd say, you know, here might be the problem. Actually, I might say there's no problem because look, you know, in Hungary, there's really not a lot of uh, election fraud. There's a little bit, but not much. Um, so I, I, as a, as a, with a deliberative de democracy perspective, I see the problems in different places then, but th that's not really a different model, I guess. But um, yeah, but without, yeah, with, with just kind of thinking about the, the, the rhetorical impact of the, of the term model. But I'm gonna have to actually make that clearer if I'm gonna continue um, using that argument. Right, okay, so the, the real question, so, um, so you've been hanging out with Reiner Force too much. So. <laughs> um, 
I have this argument with Reiner Forst and also with Christina LaFont all the time, and I, I'm actually with you in it. So the first about Rawls. So I don't think so. Reiner has the idea of reciprocity, but I don't think Rawls. So one of the issues is Rawls kind of died before he really because he, he, he was a moving target. So it's very clear his first articulation of public reason. Um, it was quite restrictive and it was restrictive in two senses. First, it was, we were art, we had to come to an agreement or we had some kind of a consensus about a conception of justice, say justice is fairness, basic. And then as we're arguing towards constitutional essentials, we all start with that shared premise and we argue, and in our arguments, we may not appeal to our comprehensive views Primarily, this you know got taken up as religious views, but it, it meant any kind of comprehensive view, right? So I, I couldn't you know appeal to utilitarianism as a fan, founding principle. Okay, so this was very restrictive. Then he starts moving, and you know because he, he it gets pointed out, well, Martin Luther King Jr. and you know, he uses religious arguments, and so then he, he introduces the proviso. On the one hand, they said, well, yeah, you can sometimes, but you have to be able to have it um, non-comprehensive. But he also, I think, even more importantly in his later work, he says, okay, it doesn't have to be justice as fairness, and it, we don't even have to have a strong agreement, but we have to have some background family resemblance ideas of justice from which we are coming, right, to, in order to have... Um, and if you look at the public reason debates, like people like Jonathan Kwong and, and people who write about deeply in the Rawlsian tradition, they're all about restraint. And they're all about um, the idea that in order to be committed to a liberal democracy, you must be committed not to saying everything in the public sphere, um, but to argue within a kind of constitutional framework. And there is a strong sense of consensus. So, you know, Christina LaFont says in her book, she says, deliberative democracy stands or falls on its ability to explain how people can come to substantive agreement about fundamentals. So I disagree with that. Um, and I'm more, I think, on what you're saying is that it's, it's not, off, first of all, it's not a free speech thing, so it's not literally off the table. People can say whatever they want, right? Um, and pe people can say racist things, people can, you know, defend slavery, but there is a question of, of if people defend slavery or racism. So Rawls's notion of mutual justification says this is not just justification, it's justification to another. Right. So it's not just I believe something that's true and here are my reasons why it's true. You know, like Calvin says, I believe that Servetus needs to be um, burned at the stake and here are my reasons and they are true reasons. Now, Rawls says it's, it's justification to another, which means that I need to find reasons that somehow appeal to or address or speak to another. And, and then the question is, what does that mean? So on the strongest interpretation that means well i have to actually have use reasons that they could accept in some strong sense um but i think that's too strong so then then and, and i tend to interpret it um procedurally that we need to be in a, in a situation in which everyone has the chance but when the but what it really comes down to it the question is am i under an obligation to offer a sincere argument and counter argument to a, to a deep racist. And my feeling is that you have to address racism, but you don't necessarily have to address it by taking it seriously. You have to argue why it's inappropriate uh, in this type of a conversation to make those arguments. But you don't look deep in the eyes of the racist and say, okay, I'm, let's really talk about, you know, the inferiority of, of, of races. And I'm going to take your argument really seriously and we're going to. Um, so I, I do think there has to be a, a line because you can't do that for every possible. Um, but I don't think so. So the off the table thing. Um, I don't like the term either, you know, um, 
But what it means to, for me is that if you're not going to address people arguments to other people directly, then you have to make an argument for why that argument is inappropriate in this position. But you do have to actually argue that some arguments are inappropriate, that they can't, you know. But maybe you're right, like, you know, John Stuart Mill's famous argument, look, we actually want to have these bad arguments out there because, you know, it means we're, we're reminded all the time if there are racists out there, we strengthen our, you know, commitment to non-racism. So it's some, you know, form of argument against dead, dead dogma. Um, but I do um, embrace a procedural and very weak view. Everyone can say whatever they want, whenever they want. Um, and that you need to give an argument, mutual justification requires, you need to give an argument for why an argument is unreasonable. Um, and what is unreasonable is um, very few things actually are unreasonable. And so my ideal is that the procedure itself, you know, will weed out the things that are kind of crazy and really are unacceptable for a group of people who think of themselves as free uh, and equal. So, but I'm told by both Christina LaFont and Reiner that it's just too nabby pamby and that you actually have to have, um, you know, it's like just too procedural and you actually have to have more uh, substantive or a more robust view of public reason. So for Reiner, it's reciprocity, uh, generality, and um, I can't remember what the third one is. Um, so um, yeah, so and, and that is, so, so I, I, I am committed to this, there are this family of, of views that all embrace mutual justification. All mutual justification views have some idea that there are some arguments that um, really can't go forward. Um, and then the question is, where do you draw the line? How substantive is it? And I draw the line, you know, I would say Rawlsian public reason people are at one end, people like Joseph, um, Jonathan Kwong and um, Lai Neufeld and some other like real Rawlsians. And then the Habermasians, I think, are, except for maybe Christina LaFont, are at the other end um, that see it more, you know, procedurally. Um, and, and less as a citizen ethic and more as, um, yeah, kind of um, procedures. So I hope that um, gave an initial um, answer. Just those, those are great questions. You actually, you hit on all the weak parts. <laughs> Not at all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simone. I, I also had the, the I, I do share this um, discomfort with models uh, in general because I see myself sometimes using. And then, so in a sense, the question, what are we talking about when we're talking about models? Like, we're right. not talking about models, properly speaking. But I, right. I, yeah, I, yeah, it's the rhetorical impact of models, what you highlight the, the way. Yeah, I, I agree because but i agree but in a sense i i feel that if this discomfort with thinking about deliberative democracy as a model is not related to the fact of being an insider so to speak so like to reject some generalizations and then because then as an insider we do see more tensions as well not, not only not only what what you just just pointed about your your views on aggreg aggregate democracy and deliberative democracy on the one hand if it's not if it's not because you're an insider in the in deliberative democracy first of all uh, in a sense so you see more tensions but second of all if it's not the philosophical vein of your work calling um talking uh louder than the political theorist vein so to speak mm -hmm. i mean in a sense well part of it is definitely being an insider and so um always being frustrated with generalizations about um deliberative democracy and feeling that they're um but uh so the other example that i use is republicanism so republicanism starts with the principle of non-domination um, just like I think the of democracy starts with the uh, principle of mutual justification, neither of them, neither of them produce a clear model of democracy. And I think it's even, you know, so 
And in non-domination, as I, I think I mentioned in the paper, you can really have the incredibly radical variations on what you think. I mean, basically, Philip had it, you know, he, 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 he pretty much, you know, accepts the institutions that we have now in liberal democracy. He thinks they need to be improved and so on. But people like uh, John McCormick and, say, um, Jeffrey Green and um, uh, there's another woman. She's just she's just written a book. It's really great. Um, they are, you know, super radical in um, I, the idea that actually non-domination requires that we endorse these plebeian institutions and actually repress um, oligarchic el elites because in the our electoral representative system they're just going to dominate there's just no there's just no way elections will always lead to the rich dominating um so but you know i'm i'm mostly i'm arguing yeah i'm as you say i'm not arguing on philosophical grounds i'm arguing on kind of pragmatic grounds that we're just missing a lot in what's going on in de democratic theory if we're trying to stuff things into um into models, and I'm and when I'm writing this book, it would be it would be great if I had a chapter on deliberative democracy, a chapter on representative democracy, a chapter on Republican democracy, and agonistic democracy, and direct democracy. But I'm not doing that because I think it would just, yeah, it would miss what's really kind of interesting and um, and try to stuff it into uh, a framework that's not really helpful. I agree. I, I would continue, but I, I think Daniel might have uh, his questions. I don't want to 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 take his no, space. No, but uh, but I do you. think. Uh, sorry, uh, I do think it's it's rather your philosophical wing that is that is uh, that is uh, doing this this job of rejecting models. That okay. that, that was my point, <laughs> Daniel. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Simone. Uh, no problem. So uh, I had I have questions, boring questions from ancient philosophy students. Great, great, great. So uh, I will start with the first one, then, which is uh, one a question that, in some form or, or other, I have posed to some of the other lecturers that have been here, which is uh, about uh, the extent to which uh, our democratic theories and our conceptions of justice, uh, they I don't know they take into consideration uh, other forms of society. So uh, my question is about uh, the part of your book, of your, I'm sorry, your paper, where you say that the idea that democracy is a necessary condition for justice, of justice. To me, it seems that uh, that idea results from a combination of two other ideas, namely that equality is a necessary condition of justice and that democracy is a necessary condition of equality. So it would result indeed that democracy is a necessary condition of justice. But even though the, the idea that equality is a necessary condition of justice can be traced all the way back to Aristotle, so we have been thinking like that for a long time now, uh, both Aristotle and, and I think the Greeks, they thought that equality could take the form of proportionality. And that thought allowed them, but Aristotle also, to recognize other forms of government as just in at least some circumstances, you know, depending on the condition of the people. So, and, and I understand that one could fear this move on the grounds that you know it could license oppressive governments, but I also wonder what a proponent of the idea that democracy is in the necessary condition of justice would have to say about the so-called primitive societies, because it seems to me there are only two choices: we either say that these societies are necessarily unjust, or we allow that they are, or at least could be, democratic in some pertinent sense. Do you agree that those are the only options available, and what do you think would be? the way to go if we adopt the idea that uh, democracy is a necessary condition for justice? So yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, you, you said it to me earlier. Um, so there are a couple of ways to answer it. I mean, one way, which is a little bit of a cop out, but um, it is a Rawlsian way of answering it. So, um, you know, Rawls says it's a theory of justice. He's, and he's, you know, his, his whole kind of constructivism is saying, look, this is this is uh, justice for us, right? This is what, in, in our Western development of constitutional democracies, um, where we take we start from a premise that people are free and equal. Um, this is what it requires, and with that premise, democracy is a necessary condition um, of justice. And then, if you ask Rawls, well, what justifies you know th that 
more foundational idea that we are uh, free and equal? You know, does that mean that, say, primitive societies that don't have that premise, they are unjust? And there, you know, he wants to stay agnostic uh, on that question. He's saying, look, this is, this is what it means for us um, in the modern world. So this is what liberal justice is. We, and he uses, you know, he has an understanding of liberal in a very broad sense to mean pretty much, you know, all, all kind of Western societies, uh, you know, from the whatever um, 18th century on. This is what it means for us. And so for us, um, democracy is a necessary condition. Habermas has a somewhat stronger view, um, which says it's not just, it is true that it's just us, but on the other hand, modernization actually has created a situation in which we have created the conditions for testing our moral intuitions in a way with inclusive debate that other, so, so we actually have grounds for thinking that it's not just ours and nobody else's, but it, there's some, something of value to it. Um, and both Rawls and Habermas would say, and I would say that democracy in these conditions is a necessary um, condition of justice. But you know, the Greeks had slavery. Slavery is unjust. Is, then yeah, from our point of view, it was an unjust society. Um, primitive, primitive cultures. So, so this actually goes to a, a different question. Um, primitive cult. Well. Primitive cultures would have to be considered to be unjust from our point of view, even if it's the case that um, many of the norms and conventions that are produced and, and acted on are the product of a, of a kind of consensual, um, responsive uh, development so that, you know, everybody kind of gets, gets input into it. Um, that would still not, I think, come up to our standard of um, democracy uh, and justice. No, but 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 that 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 doesn't have to lead to a problematic um, developmental view. This is okay. We're just, and you know, they're not just, um, or that only modernity is just. Um, does that answer or begin to address your question? Yes, it does, uh, but. Uh... In the end, then you said we would have to say that because when you said this is a condition of liberal justice, I thought you were going the other way. Like, okay, so the historical conditions now are such for these societies where this is justice. But in the end, you kind of go the other way, I think. You say, well, no. you know, yes, the, you know, the issue is really raised by, um, by Rawls's discussion of decent societies. So and a lot of people find that deeply problematic. I'm one of them that finds it deeply problematic. So, but he's very clear: decent societies are not just, right? Yeah. Um, but there's this idea that you know they're responsive. They they kind of have their ear to the to the. But you know the view of the culture is kind of homogeneous. Um, there's no protection to pluralism, and they're absolutely what is it called? There is no there is no decent society anywhere. <laughs> there's no such thing. Because I think in order to have that kind of relationship where the government or the, the powerful institutions really are responsive and reflect uh, the, you know, the authentic views of the people, you actually have to have liberal democratic or con uh, constitutional democratic uh, structures uh, of rights. So, um, yeah. So uh, I would say that they are... Um, and, and I actually, I, I, I would go further. I would say that democracy is a right, a human right. So, um, okay, you definitely can't have, yeah. So it is a necessary condition of justice. Okay. So um, the other two questions I have, I think they, they are both in some way or other about the concepts of instrumental and intrinsic value. Oh, yeah. Um, the first one is the, well, for me, Again, from background of ancient philosophy, we, we had studied these terms because they appear in the beginning of the second book of the Republic. And then they are used mm -hmm. again in Aristotle's uh, Nicomachean Ethics and his Eudemian Ethics too. So uh, for us, you know, we either understand these as a division between things that are good in themselves yeah. and things that are good not in themselves, but because they are somehow connected to other good things. And uh, the main connection we, we think of is when they have good things are their consequence, you know, like when they precipitate things that are good. 
So medicine is a favorite example, you know, from, from the ancients. Nobody, nobody drinks medicine because they want medicine, think medicine is good. They drink it because of what it does. But there is a second way of, of understanding this division as a division between things that are good because of their necessary co consequences and things that are good because of their accidental consequences, the consequences that are not necessary. Some people rather this second way of understanding, they, they prefer it because uh, they think it's very hard to think of something that has no consequence whatsoever and that it's good in any way. <laughs> so, you know, axiologically speaking, it's kind of weird to, to understand it in the first way. But I thought you were understanding the division these divisions along the first lines when you talked about rational disagreement among equals you know and you present the argument according to which democratic decision making uh, is uniquely suited to satisfy or interested in being treated as equals right but then you say that although it could appear at first sight that on this argument democracy had instrumental rather than intrinsic value you know as a means to achieving justice this is not the case because the, adje the adjective uniquely is important here. This, once you said that, you know, uh, this made me unsure of how exactly we're interpreting the difference between instrumental and intrinsic value. Because I think that even if, if we agree that democratic decision making is necessary to, to satisfy our interests, you know, if it, it, even if it is necessary for justice, that wouldn't mean yet that it is sufficient. And so it could mean that it is either a part or, you know, uh, in any way uh, directly related. So, but if that is indeed the case, then the way I see it, democratic decision making could only have instrumental value. So, could you comment a little bit on that? If right, you agree with um, so, but I just, before I answer that, I just so I don't think there's anybody who says that democracy could be sufficient for justice. Um, Exactly. It's a necessary condition. Yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. So here's my dilemma. It's my dilemma is totally strategic. Um, it's not. I, I understand what, what you're saying. Absolutely. Um, so I'm doing a survey, a critical survey um, of contemporary democratic theory, and there are there, there's this whole debate about the value of democracy, and that and it, it it is often discussed in on two different dimensions. One is the intrinsic versus instrumental. But the other is sometimes talked about the procedure versus the outcome. And so, um, and, and they're not exactly the same. So um, the procedure versus outcome is this idea that the value of democracy is in, is in the decision procedure, but we could, you know, it's not, it's not the, because the laws and policies that can come out of democracy are, are maybe not always the best, but we'd have to have it anyway, because there's something about the procedure um, independent of the value of the outcome that has value, that it treats us in a certain way. Then the question is, well, what kind of value is it? And there, I have to be honest, <laughs> the philosophers love to like dig down deep into this whole idea of intrinsic. Um, and I think some of those debates really sort of go off and, 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 and leave the question about about democracy and so i i am using it in a pretty loose way and I, I do in the book have a little bit of a justification um for that because if you use it in a strict way yeah lots of people say there is no really intrinsic you know first of all what is you, you say the intrinsic value of democracy but you don't even know what democracy is i mean intrinsic value of like voting of, of you know so um so in some strict sense there is no intrinsic value right but but you do want to have some idea of, of the inherent value, and one of the and one of the ways I want to um, contrast this is that realists realists don't think that um, realists don't think that democracy necessarily comes to good outcomes. So they but there's something about the procedure. But what what it is about the procedure is that. The procedure mitigates violence and conflict, right? So without these procedures, we'd be bashing each other over the heads or, you know, killing each other. And so democracy has value, but it's instrumental value because for a downhard uh, proceduralist, I mean, realist, if you could find some other procedure that also what was able to mitigate um, violence equally well, then you, you, you wouldn't keep democracy. So that is for me instrumental, even though it's not outcome based. But people like Cristiano, it's clear you, you couldn't replace democracy with anything else. 
even if it's not strictly speaking intrinsic for someone like Cristiano, you can't replace it. It's unique. And so, um, so in that sense, so I, I do, so, so my, my, my problem, you think my problem is with how I define intrinsic, but it's actually how I define instrumental because for me, an instrumental value, it, uh, it means that st strictly speaking, if it's an instrumental value, you could replace it, right? You could do something else could produce the consequence. Yeah, I know, because you're a philosopher. <laughs> I know, I know. So um, I, I'm also, because it, it's, it's so complicated, I am trying to, to simplify it. So, but it, you know, it doesn't, there, there's a whole bunch of stuff written, particularly on Cristiano, is it intrinsic, is it, is it, and, and is it, nothing, nothing really hangs on that um, for me. So what I think I'm going to do is I, I do try to replace inherent value. I try to use that word and as opposed to intrinsic value. Um, but this distinction that you point out, which I sort of use, but I'm going to be clear about it, whether it's um, it's instrumental, but it's uniquely, right? So even though it's instrumental, only this thing can do it um, versus contingent. That is, it's instrumental, but maybe something else could do it. Some other decision procedure, procedure could also have it. That's probably a good distinction um, for me to make. But because also the, the structure of the book, I have a whole chapter on the, you know, on the inherent or intrinsic and the whole trap chapter on the instrumental. And so I, I'll have to, um, but yeah, strictly speaking, what you say is correct. And, um, but I, it's not a book on philosophy, so I don't really want to get tangled up too much in the intrinsic, you know, read a lot of Christine Korsgaard. What is value? Uh, well, let me just say your article, Justice or Legitimacy, the Barricades of Public Reason, that is, without a doubt, one of my favorite articles of political philosophy ever. <laughs> and you just gave me one of the best, and the best answers about intrinsic value that I've ever had when talking about with on your other philosophy alive. Because you are right. We kind of barricade around this concept. We have that, uh, that tendency. And it's very hard. You have to talk to people who are actually studying axiology for them to come out and say what you're saying. It's like, there is no intrinsic value. If you, if you really go all the way in that concept, it loses all meaning. So I think you're, you're right. You know, I think you're right. And I do believe that it is enough to say that it's, it's instrumental and necessary, because once you, you pose it as necessary, it is resolved, I think, the problem. So the last question is about uh, the justification, the justification theorists. And there's something you said uh, in your presentation that stuck with me when you said, so unanimity is not majority. And that is a discussion that we had uh, here in, in UFRJ because in this is a, a difficulty for me because when people say, so if you have a, a, a unanimous rule, you do not have a majority rule. And I'm like, that's, that doesn't make sense to me. If you pose a majority rule and everybody agrees, to me, the majority has voted. But we, are, we argue with a few colleagues who do not think that way. Let me say, if, if I can make it clear why I think that's important to my question. Because when you talk about uh, the justification theorists, you say that they shift the locus of value to deliberation and make voting instrumental to the value of mutual deliberation. Right. If I understood you correctly, you know, uh, justification is something that happens during the deliberative process when people involved present a reason, listen to each other, etc. But when you illustrate that move with the example of the shipwreck proto citizens, you picture voting as a strictly unnecessary result from the deliberative process, something that needs to be carried out only if unanimity is not reached. So, but if that is true, how can voting be both instrumental and at the same time strictly unnecessary, strictly unnecessary result from the deliberative process? You know. Or are we to understand that voting is only instrumental to mutual education when we scale up? So to, to connect with the first part, instead of saying that voting is what is, uh, you know, what is instrumental to justification, why don't we say that the majority rule is what is instrumental to justification? Like once you have that rule, you have to justify and deliberate. And then that rule can be satisfied both ways. No, so, that, no. so I understand your point, but uh, that, that's not what I'm saying. So. Uh, I feel so. One of the, the the cases I make, not in this paper, actually, not even in this book, but in my some other work, is that um, deliberation is not a decision procedure. Um, because because just to talk and give each other reasons, 
right? That's the, now, some people think that it inherently, intrinsically, whatever, um, implies that consensus is the decision, but it doesn't. It doesn't at all. It is, um, deliberation is a way of kind of working out things. And then the decision procedure is a secondary question, which actually you have to deliberate about. And there are some certain situations in which actually a majority rule will make it for better decision, better deliberation. Um, so because, you know, in, there are some circumstances, for example, that if you have a unanimity rule, people are just going to cave. They're not really going to, you know, um, you, that you will have um, a better, uh, more substantive type of deliberation if you have a majority rule. So I separate the idea of closure and decision which is there are a gazillion different ways of, um, of deciding, of, of coming to closure versus mutual justification, which is not a decision procedure. It is a procedure uh, of, of you know, clarification and, um, and it's, it's a, what's the word I use? Sometimes I, I don't even remember my own terminology, but it's not a decision procedure. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, decision, it's decision oriented, right? So it, it's of course always aiming at a decision. So in order to have deliberation, it's gotta be practical. We have to say, okay, what is to be done? Let's talk about it. So it's always aimed at a decision. What is the best thing to do? But it does not itself contain any necessary decision procedure at all, including unanimity and consensus. Even though, this gets even more complicated, even though my arguments often need to try to convince you, so it looks as if there's a consensus, um, you know, and Habermas has, has a kind of ideal consensus, but for real world liberation, even if there is a counterfactual end of consensus in the way I argue, right? So I'm trying to convince you, so this looks like the the natural end point would be if we were all convinced. In empirical deliberation, there is no default decision procedure for any justification, and we have to choose it. And it could be anything. And so I use that illustration not to say that it's not necessary, just to say, look, you could imagine it, you know, uh, not having a vote being our decision. Is that... Is that I, I see. No, I see your point, but I have to think about it. <laughs> right now. Yeah, I never thought about it this way. I really never did. To me, it was a lot simpler than what you were saying. I have to think about that. So let me uh, let me take advantage now to ask everybody if they have questions uh, to put in the private to put in the in the chat on YouTube. Uh, Anna, Anna has more questions. Come on, Anna. please save me. Let me think. <laughs> oh, not at all. It's 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 more of a curiosity question, uh, Simone, about the whole project of the book. Uh, I mean, I'm curious uh, about the book and and particularly um, the scope um, you are you are um, envisioning uh, to think about political theory. Because as as I see from this uh, from this chapter or what you 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 shared with us uh, on roles and contemporary democratic theory. It is based on 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 sort of an anglophone, Anglo, uh, um, English speaking, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 contemporary democratic theory, or or, or with some dialogue with German speaking democratic theory. Of course, it's difficult to separate this this um, uh, these groups because I do think they. Uh, right. Since Habermas and Rawls, they intermingle, intermingle uh, together. But th th these are two questions, actually. One is, is concerned this scope and and how how you yeah how you define it. And second, it's more of a curiosity because um, as I, as I told you, I'm not a Rawlsian a Rawlsian scholar. And by the way, I I I, I was thinking in my questions perhaps more with Ben Habib. Than oh, with right. Forst and Lafont, but yeah. I mean, it's they're, they're, it's family, so to speak. Uh, but um, the, last year, as a, as a, as I was um, working on Ben Habib's reception of Rawls uh, Rawls work, I came across a, a sort of a reception of Rawls in in the east of Europe. 
And the, 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 the story is from the Berovnik um, seminaries back in the 70s. Yeah, I, 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 I used to go to them. Yeah, you, 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 you do. Oh, so I'm we have to, now, I have to say. <laughs> wow, you used to go to the Berovnik. Yeah, as a graduate student. I went. Wow. So it perhaps was, I have it was to... really amazing. It was amazing. Oh, so yeah, yeah, and 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 and, and, and coming from these Dubrovnik seminars, and I was I was I started researching, but uh, I started to be curious actually because I'm curious. I have this. Um, I'm curious, and uh, the impact of roles in the in the East, and a figure such as uh, Kish Janusz, Janusz Kis. Yeah. Traditionalist, yeah. So if you if you could um, if you, if you are thinking about including like um, figures like this, of course it's not. Uh, it, 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 I'm not sure it fits your definition of democratic political theory, uh, but of course, I mean, Kish, uh, his 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 trajectory is is really interesting, coming from the so-called uh, Budapest school and then going, um, at, but always in the democratic opposition. And when he read a theory of justice back in the in the seventies, right. I mean, uh, I mean, so I mean, if he, if there is so um, so the scope of the book or the the um, so the the, th the thinking of the book is that in the last twenty maybe twenty five years, democratic theory has really shifted, and um, part of that shift, as I try to articulate, is a move away from models, but. Um, but the shift has really been impacted by the so-called crisis of democracy. So um, it's organized uh, around looking at contemporary democratic theory in response to that crisis. So two things that I don't do. So I do not discuss democratic theory in historical context. I don't start with Aristotle and move up and you know, Rousseau and forget about that. It's, so it's really all really seriously contemporary. Um, and then um, I take up particular debates, and I, I guess it's mostly in English language, although there's some, um, but, it, but it's, it's actually, so I've extracted some Rawls out of the book, but there's not a lot of Rawls in the book, because as I say in the paper, Rawls doesn't have democratic theory. Um, but the first part is this idea that this debate about why we might value uh, democracy has replaced um, uh, these models of democracy. And although in the paper, I only talk about the intrinsic, this notion of equality, it, 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 it's um, it's placed within the context of all this worry about, look, we can't solve climate change. We can't solve any of our problems. Um, the rise of technocracy, the rise of you know meritocracy. Um, so China just published this paper saying we're really a democracy, you know, because uh, so, so, so the pressures on democracy right now really have produced, first of all, in the first part of the book, this, um, this return to a value of democracy. Um, and some of it, particularly, you know, the egalitarian stuff is this, you know, Anglo-American Anglo analytic. But when I move to instrumental and talk about epistocracy, this idea that we are going to, you know, come up um, with um, better outcomes or um, also the, the realists who say, no, we come up with lousy outcomes. Um, that's that's really going to move away from this Rawlsian model. And then in the next um, section, I look at concepts. So, for example, populism has led to a um, a rethinking or a re a re um, taking another look at the concept of the people. And it's been really exciting and interesting uh, notions of the people. The same with representation. So more and more people are thinking, uh, you know. Uh, electoral representation is inherently oligarchic, maybe, you know, plutocratic. Um, and so there are these new criticisms of electoral representation um, as being um, deeply problematic. There's a whole new set of arguments about the use of referendums. So referendums are up all across liberal democracies everywhere. It's part of the populist trend, but uh, it's also led to uh, really interesting innovative theory to think about how, how we think about um, uh, that. There's new thought about parties. Parties, you know, in part of the democratic crisis, parties are going down. And so there's been a revitalization of like, why is this bad? Um, maybe parties are okay. And then uh, in, in the final section, um, I, I want to talk about new interventions, so critical race theory and democratic theory and uh, climate justice, 
and you know some other of these crises that have, so my, my, my argument is really to look at the innovations um democratic innovations both um in the theory and also in, in thinking that institutions that have spurred been spurred by crisis so it's kind of the opposite so a lot of crisis literature is this doom and gloom right oh my god we're you know it's dying we're, we're going down the tubes it might be true but but it actually has spawned a lot of really innovative very interesting democratic theory um which is i wouldn't say optimistic but um but it's really thinking about really seriously ways of how do we deal with future generations? How do we actually, you know, talk about climate change within, because climate change is one of those things that tends to lead people to technocracy and away from democracy. And um, so that's really the, the, um, the frame of the book, I guess. Oh, you're, you're muted. Thank you. Very interesting. We are already, oh, already waiting for, for the book, for sure. <laughs> we should yeah, translate it, actually. <laughs> so I uh, guess it was not me. I, I guess you gave us all plenty to think about because I'm asking my students if they have any questions and they're all just, you know, still digesting everything. Um, I'll, I think that is it then. Thank you very much, Simone. This was wonderful. Thank you. I always like to try my ideas, and the questions were really good. Lots yeah, I mean, and since your book is coming out, I mean, we, we will invite you to come again to speak. Okay, yeah, I got to finish it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, 2022, right? I saw the... the... Yeah, yeah, that's in principle. You know, the, the pandemic set me back a bit, and now uh, I'm the chair of my department, so that's also setting me back, but I have a hard deadline, so... Mm. So, yeah, we'll, we'll be looking forward to it. Thank okay. you very much. Oh, thank you very much for the invitation. Bye-bye.